a quarter. We started uh, the quarter with my uh, chapter reviewing African economic development, uh, and uh, in that in that review, if you if you recall, there's sort of um, uh, three parts to that review. The the first part is well, why was Africa poor to begin with? Um, and that's of course a very important question. So it's very clear that in the uh, 1970s, 1980s, uh, most African countries were poorer than the countries in the rest of the world. In the 1960s, at the start of the uh, independence era, um, when the colonial empires uh, fell apart, um, there were plenty of countries around the world that were as poor as African countries. But what happened in the 60s and 1970s uh, was uh, it's sometimes called the, the Asian miracle, right? Uh, which is that uh, a whole bunch of countries in uh, Asia that were very, very poor, just as poor as African countries, countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, they started growing and they steadily kept on growing uh, and they grew at rates of six, 7% a year. And in 1980, China started growing uh, and uh, at, at rates of eight, 9% uh, a year. And, and so the rest of the world, uh, almost all countries uh, grew very rapidly. African countries didn't. And indeed in the 1980s, African countries, GDP was flat or declining. Um, and so by the beginning of 1990, uh, it was pretty clear that uh, African countries were the poorest in the world and, uh, and, and uh, explaining that, well, why, why, why did that happen is a big part of what development economists do. The second part of the paper was about the growth that started in the 1990s and about optimism about growth uh, going, going forward. And so a lot of the papers that we reviewed in the course of this class uh, were using randomized control trials uh, to show often uh, quite substantial effectiveness, sometimes ineffectiveness, but in general, the picture is there are many, many uh, uh, changes that can be made either in the form of adopting investments or uh, improvements in education, extension of education uh, that generate high returns for uh, uh, individuals in African countries. And so the, the overall outlook should be, uh, should be good in terms of growth. And if Walker could buy some options for rapid economic growth in African countries, I would say it's not going to be a super high return investment, but it should be a positive return investment. That is, there doesn't seem to be any reason to expect negative growth um, in the next 20 years in African countries. Quite the opposite, right? We uh, should expect uh, fairly substantial positive growth in African countries. So that was, you know, what we saw a lot of papers about the, the room for positive economic growth for structural transformation is, is clearly there. There's lots of low hanging fruit um, to, to generate returns. Uh, and then the third part of the paper, right, if you recall, was about those looming um, possible headwinds that, you know, could overturn that result. And one was pandemics. Uh, and, you know, it's turning out the COVID pandemic isn't seeming to have as significant effects on um, African economies as it is on some uh, other economies for reasons that aren't clear yet. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's, that's that, that was the idea. So today we're returning to that first part of that paper, why was Africa uh, countries in general so, so poor to start with in the 60s and 70s and didn't grow uh, until the 1990s? Uh, what, what are the factors responsible for that? And so, of course, uh, this factor that uh, looms large is the, is the slave trade. Um, and uh, this is graph, which while I've been talking, you've been looking at it, right? Traces through some of the um, uh, paths of the Atlantic slave trade and where uh, many of the slaves uh, went. So between 1650 and 1860, about uh, between 10 and 15 million uh, people were captured and transported across the uh, Americas. Um, I had this so that you could see a little bit bigger so that I wasn't covering the, uh, uh, the wording here. 
Yeah. Um, now, feel free to interrupt anytime as I'm going through this with uh, commentary or suggestions or, or questions that, that you might have. Um, here's another uh, graph uh, that, uh, you know, just kind of illustrates the, the, the same thing. Sometimes what Americans often um, overlook or forget or tend to neglect because of the salience of the legacy of slavery, uh, which was after emancipation followed by uh, 100 years of uh, Jim Crow segregation. And so the issue of the legacy of slavery remains very salient even um, today. Uh, but it's important to uh, remember and to keep uh, the history of slavery in perspective that not that many slaves went originally transported into um, the Americas. Uh, the vast majority of the slave trade went to Brazil uh, and to the Caribbean. Uh, and these were um, societies that were overwhelmingly uh, slave societies. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a much bigger picture to the legacy of slavery than just the issues uh, in the United States. There was also uh, a trans-Saharan slave trade, so going across from West Africa, across the Sahara Desert to Egypt, uh, across the Sahara Desert to North Africa, uh, across from Egypt then into um, the, um, the Red Sea area and the Ottoman Empire. There was an Indian slave trade, not nearly as big in magnitude, but it was, it was there going from the Indian Ocean over to, uh, to India. So there's uh, complicated relationships uh, all around uh, the African um, continent. Oh, sorry. Uh, here's a little finer. So this is the data that uh, Nun and Wanchikan are going to be using where Africa is broken down uh, according to an ethnic atlas uh, that was created in the 18, um, using uh, uh, sources from the, uh, the, 18th, uh, the, the 19th century, the 1850s. Um, so uh, George Murdoch was the kind of early anthropologist uh, tried to delimit uh, the boundaries of ethnic groups uh, in, in Africa. And of course, there's many problems. Every specialist looks at this map and says, this is ridiculous, uh, but they know one tiny little corner uh, of this uh, map. and uh, and so each little corner is wrong. Uh, that doesn't mean that the whole picture on average might not be reasonable as a, uh, as a guess uh, about ethnic um, areas uh, of, of former ethnic groups in, in African um, societies. So this Professor? gives you an idea of the great variation. The point of Nunn's work is you can see that there's a lot of variation across ethnic groups. Some ethnic groups were seem to have hardly been enslaved at all. Other ethnic groups, especially here in the Congo area, seem to have been very heavily uh, raided for slaves. Uh, there was a question there. Yeah, per, over here, Professor. Um, I was going to ask, like. Um, how come there was appears to be so much of a concentration of like where slave traders captured their slaves in like the middle west of Africa? How come they didn't participate in the slave trade like in the on the western coast of North Africa? Because like geographically speaking, it's equally accessible. What were like the cultural differences back in the 1600s that made them like isolate their their exporting to that kind of corner of the continent? So good, good question. And there's all kinds of complicated reasons for that. I'm not an expert of the slave, uh, you know, history. Um, but uh, so, you know, clearly a, an important factor is, is the uh, profitability calculation. Um, and the profitability calculation uh, is that the way slaves were captured is that European merchant ships, merchant houses, right, came and bought them. Um, and so they, they, they were purchased. And they were purchased from uh, local, let's call them warlords, local leaders. And we'll, we'll see Leonard and uh, Wanchikan and uh, Nan have, you know, point to other uh, mechanisms that were at work. But basically, for most of the big history of the slave trade, the slaves were purchased. So the ships would come along the coast here. They would send out a canoe uh, or you know a rowboat, go to shore, say 
we want to purchase. Uh, and I apologize, my, uh, what happened to my, oh, there I am. Okay. Uh, my, my video thing goes in and out. So they were purchased um, uh, and they were purchased uh, relatively cheaply. Uh, up here, uh, slaves would have been, purchasing of slaves would have been very expensive. Um, and so partly around, uh, you know, the 1700s is the Europeans, uh, as they explored around the coast of Africa, and starting in the 1600s, right, really, uh, realized that there was an enormous uh, uh, trading opportunity where they could trade guns and they could trade uh, other kinds of household items like mirrors and things like that, that were relatively cheap in Europe uh, for uh, human captives uh, here in Africa. And, and just the calculus of profitability wasn't that high for doing that up here. Another one other reason, of course, is that the human, the density of population here is much lower in North Africa than it is in Central Africa. So one reason why you point right here, this was called the Bite of Benin in the old uh, old maps. Um, uh, this is, remains the densest place in Africa. So Nigeria is the largest population country. Nigeria is right here uh, and remains the, the densest population country. So human labor is cheap there. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, it's basically a profitability calculus. Uh, another reason, of course, for the profitability calculus is um, the cost of sailing across the Atlantic. Um, so the slave trade only really starts in earnest when you have uh, the sugarcane plantations getting established in the Caribbean. So you got uh, an activity where slave labor was extremely profitable, partly because you wanted to have a whole bunch of people all in the same place, all at the same time, all doing the same thing. And you could supervise them by threatening them with extreme physical punishments. You could supervise them e easily. If you think about most farming agriculture, you don't have a whole bunch of people all working in the same place at the same time. Instead, you have somebody lonely, right, plowing a field over here and somebody else doing something over there. There's diminishing returns to having a large group of people concentrated in much uh, agricultural operations. So whole variety of reasons then, um, partly also right to do with the uh, prevailing winds. So if winds don't work well, uh, it becomes hard for you to transport one way as opposed to the other. So there's just a, a lot of different kinds of reasons. It's a fascinating area to study. Great question. So we'll continue on with our picture. Here's the Indian slave trade. Uh, so off the, it's going across the Indian Ocean to both the Arabian Peninsula and to the Indian subcontinent. These are the estimates of uh, Atlantic uh, slave trade, the uh, Sahara slave trade, and the Indian Ocean slave trade. I'm curious, anybody's ask, going to ask a question? No historians uh, here in the audience? The, the most, one of the most interesting things of this is that, well, how do we know? What's the, how, where does this estimate of 11 million people come from? Um, well, you have to remember that the only way African slaves came to the New World was by merchant ships transporting them. Right? They didn't swim, they didn't walk, uh, they, they came as cargo. And what's the one thing that for 2000 years has been recorded very well in every port? What, what's your cargo, right? You've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, um, many of you, right? You know that every time Jack Sparrow has to put into a port, there's a port official who says, what's your cargo? What, what are you carrying? because uh, you have to pay taxes on your cargo because in for 2000 years, right, the sovereign has uh, kept the right to tax trade coming in through ports. So um, the most recorded thing through human history is uh, uh, transactions that are taking place through ports. So 
all of the boats coming in uh, to the New World have uh, manifests of the, their cargoes. And it's from those manifests. And most of those manifests remain stored in the customs warehouses uh, of the ports in the various countries and then became parts of their national archives. So starting in the 1960s and 1970s, a whole group of historians mounted a massive project to record all of those manifests. Uh, there's a, back in the day, there was a CD-ROM. There's a website that you can go to now and you can see all those manifests. So that's the basis for these estimates is have a very complete uh, set. You know, obviously there's many incomplete things in it, but uh, uh, historians seem are pretty satisfied that this is covering a lot of the manifests of the slave trade um, for that for that year. It's much less for the Saharan slave trade, where obviously there weren't ports, uh, it was going over land, and so there's much less knowledge about how many slaves are being transported. And then the Indian Ocean slave trade also uh, it's been less investigated. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, you know, if you speak Turkish or you speak Arabic and can read and write uh, old Arabic and old Turkic, then uh, there's new groups of historians who are exploring the slave trade and the magnitude of the slave trade in the former Ottoman Empire and Indian Ocean. Very fascinating area if you're, if you're interested in that kind of history. Do you think uh, people that died throughout their journey are counted um in those numbers? Yeah, much harder. Absolutely. Good question. That's not something I have any expertise on. So uh, it's entirely possible that at the beginning of the slave trade, you know, 10 to 20 percent of uh, people being transported were died en route, right? So there's uh, 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 many, you know, instances, uh, some famous cases, right, of uh, uh, ships being scuttled with their cargo aboard, uh, their human cargo aboard, so that the ship owners could uh, claim insurance uh, and saying that, you know, the ship was uh, lost uh, in, a, in, a, in a storm. Uh, and, and so there's, you know, those of you familiar with uh, movies from the, you know, from that period of the slave trade, uh, about British history know that this is the subject of several uh, of those movies. I'm blanking right now off the, uh, off the name, but uh, absolutely. So that's a, you know, estimating that kind of thing is something uh, obviously much harder and for relevant for our purposes, um, what Nunn did, what Nathan Dunn, Nunn did is went through these archives and when they had the ship's manifest and looked at the names uh, of all the slaves listed on those manifests and then used the matching from the people's names to their ethnic groups, since names typically match ethnic groups. Um, and that's how he was able to arrive at a, an estimate uh, of the incidence of slavery across different ethnic groups uh, by using that. So for the people who were, who were um, who died en route, their names might not be recorded when they when they landed uh, in the final manifest. So there'll be some absolutely some mis mismeasurement. So uh, in their paper, they talk about some of that measurement error that they know. They think of this, I think, as the the first effort along these lines, and certainly not as the final effort. Uh, fully hoping that historians will devote more and more time to getting more and more uh, measurement. Uh, a better measurement of these uh, of these numbers. So let me continue on. We get to the heart of the. So we might ask, going back to you know the broad question is uh, the slave trade happened a long time ago, um, and we might say you know what's is there any sense that there's still an impact of the slave trade today? Does the legacy of the slave trade still matter today, right? And this is a favorite question of historians, right? Um, there's a famous joke that uh, even I hate to repeat, but, uh, uh, but uh, it's a, not really a joke, it's a quip or an aphorism uh, that uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping, the leader of China, was asked uh, uh, what he uh, thought about the uh, impact of the French Revolution uh, on European society, and he said, "Oh, it's too early to tell." Um, and this was, you know, 200 years after the French Revolution. Um, so historians, right, uh, love to ask, "Well, 
what was the impact for today on things that happened 2000 years ago? And in some sense, some things are obvious and some things, right? So we all engage in kind of that casual historicism. We engage in counterfactual history. Uh, what if uh, Jesus hadn't uh, preached? Uh, what would the world look like uh, today? And when we engage in that counterfactual history, we're implicitly saying, well, something that happened 2000 years ago had some kind of impact um, today. The people who say, well, you know, the world probably still be exactly the same, right? Um, there'd be different names for things, but probably everything else would just be the same and just be named different instead of people being named Christians and having a variety of sects of Christians. Uh, there'd be uh, some other name, some other word, uh, and there'd be an equal number of variety of groupings. Um, so that's where, you know, uh, things that happened a long time ago don't matter. And on the other side of counterfactual history, you say, well, if, you know, Jesus hadn't been there, we'd all be living in, uh, uh, we'd all be living in uh, authoritarian autocracies with no democratic participation, no civil liberties. Uh, all that was due to, uh, you know, the revolution of uh, uh, Jesus's preaching to 2000 years ago, right? So that kind of counterfactual history is a favorite uh, topic in, in history. And, and so here we're interested, none and others are interested. And of course, it's a very live issue in the United States today as we see uh, a big movement by the uh, people call, call themselves ADOS, uh, Africa, uh, uh, is it American descendants of slaves? Um, uh, and uh, in particular, if you're interested in the subject, I strongly encourage you to read the new book by Sandy Darity. Uh, William Darity, who's an economist at uh, University of North Carolina, has written pretty much the definitive book about uh, reparations uh, for descendants of slaves in the United States. Um, it's a really interesting topic. So we're still a very relevant topic today to ask uh, what's the impact of the slave trade uh, on, uh, on the present. Um, so, for African societies, you might say, well, what the slave trade did was, uh, uh, was basically uh, robbing um, uh, a uh, uh, 100 years or 200 years of African societies of uh, young people who would have reproduced uh, because obviously slave traders weren't interested in buying old people. Um, so they uh, robbed people who would have took by force people who would have been reproducing. And so African countries have much lower population density than they would have. And so they're a lot less urbanized than they would have been. Um, and as you, many of you who are writing papers and some of you remember from the reading, urbanization is a big driver of wealth and development. And so you could think of that as a major impact of the slave trade that it de-urbanized African uh, economic growth and left African countries poorer than they would have been. Um, you might think also that uh, many African societies developed strategies to avoid being captured. So in Burkina Faso today, uh, you can go around Burkina Faso and very interesting in some of the older villages that are near hills, you'll go walking around and somebody will take you on a little walk up to the up to the tops of the hills, small mountains really, they're only you know, three or 400 feet high, but at the top, they'll show you the old terraces where people used to farm. And you say, well, why would people used to farm way up here, terrible land, you know, you, down there you have a nice big floodplain. They'll say, well, those were the days of slavery. Uh, and uh, you wanted to farm in a place where you could make sure you could see if raiders were coming. Um, and so people moved up into the hillsides, so they uh, got a lot lower um, yields than they would have been. So all kinds of strategies about what to plant. Maybe you plant a whole variety of crops instead of the most profitable crop, because that way you're moving around in different parts of the village. You're not always in the same place. Can I, can imagine all kinds of different strategies that people took uh, that then persisted and uh, once slavery had ended in the 1850s, if those strategies still persisted uh, or there wasn't as much learning as would have happened otherwise, then people were poor. Uh, there's other kinds of hypotheses. Maybe, you know, if you're uh, going to uh, uh, likely be enslaved, uh, 
uh, you say, well, what's the point of investing? Somebody's just going to come along and capture me and take me away as a slave. Um, and so people reduce their time horizons, right? The whole live fast, die young kind of thing. Uh, so if you think that that's a cultural, a shared cultural outlook, you might think that the slave trade, that experience of the slave trade shifted that. And you might ask, well, how much would it have to shift, right? So you ask yourself if, if you had two societies, one society thought, oh, I'm going to live to a ripe old age on average of 55 years old, and I'll see uh, my grandchildren, uh, and I want my grandchildren to grow up in the nice shade of uh, a mango tree plantation. And the other society said, well, more than likely I'll be dead or enslaved by 30. Um, so I'm probably not going to live to see my uh, grandchildren uh, playing under the mango trees. Um, so why bother planting them? Um, so you might ask yourself how, how much that outlook, how much that difference would matter for, uh, for growth. Um, so yeah, and finally, the, the one that uh, Nan and Wanchikan are going to address is this breakdown of social co cooperation, um, that, that uh, in particular social trust. So let's turn to, uh, just briefly before we come to that, to Nunn's earlier work. So Nathan Nunn's an economic historian, I think he's at Harvard still, he may have moved. Um, but uh, he compiled this data set, uh, assigned uh, people then from, uh, from the ethnic group that they came from, uh, and, uh, and thus was able to construct a, a measure of the incidence of slavery from different countries. And, and not surprisingly then, but quantitatively, so everybody knew this, that you know, oh, most of the slaves came from Nigeria and Zaire, right? Walker pointed to that right away, uh, or somebody else, uh, you know, when looking at the, at the maps. Uh, but none was able then to quantify this in a much finer way than had ever been quantified, um, the, the source of uh, slaves. And uh, then is able to run a regression where the outcome is some long run economic outcome like the income of the country per capita, like growth rate per capita, like democraticness per capita or democraticness of the country. And then the explanatory variable is how much this country was enslaved uh, 200 years ago, uh, right? So that's the basic equation. Uh, and so you could be really agnostic about that. You could say, well, the slavery, you know, that happened 200 years ago, why should that matter at all? for how rich people are today. Um, the, you know, establishing a factory to make uh, those cool African shirts that Professor Kavane was wearing, um, that he isn't today wearing traditional corduroy because now it's cold. Um, but uh, establishing that factory, uh, you know, what is, when somebody's deciding to establish a factory, are they saying, oh, I was enslaved. My, uh, not me, but my ancestors were enslaved. I, I'm not gonna make that factory. Um, you might say, well, that seems kind of implausible uh, and that, that there'd still be some 200 years later that that would be affecting decision making by um, investors, by entrepreneurs in, in African societies, right? So that's, that'd be your, I think the coefficient should be zero. I think we should not be able to reject the null hypothesis that this coefficient beta one is zero. On the other hand, you could be looking at all those things that I just mentioned uh, uh, those uh, reasons for why the slave trade might uh, linger, why its effects might linger and say, well, the more the society was enslaved 200 years ago, the, the lower should be these outcomes today. So that's the empirical question. And uh, he runs the regression. Uh, this is just what the uh, scatter plot looks like. For those of you who are doing data analysis, right? Um, you always want to do this. Right? Don't just run your regressions without doing some scatter plots, without mapping your data, always very important. So here's the x-axis is measuring total slave exports, uh, y-axis is measuring GDP, and uh, lo and behold, a very strong, right? I didn't, don't you like to use the word strong, but uh, uh, a very clear negative relationship uh, the coefficients estimated at negative 0.11 with a t-stat of five, right, which is well above our normal uh, cutoff conventional significance level of 1.96, right? 
So that's the, that's the big relationship that Nunn finds in this paper. Um, and I will just, uh, he also finds the same relationship with growth. So growth in two th 1960 to 2000 is also apparently slower. So not only are the countries poorer, they also grow less. Um, and that coefficient is also negative and quite uh, substantially statistically and uh, statistically significant. Uh, there's the close-up of the corner. Um, then he runs a variety of regressions of other political outcomes uh, of the slave trade and very often finds that um, the coefficient here is statistically significant. So the more you were slave raided, the more military coups you have, the more you were slave raided, the more revolutions you have, the more you were slave raided, the less was political stability. Uh, the more you were slave raided, the lower people evaluate uh, government quality, regulatory quality, control of corruption, um, risk of expropriating your property rights, right? I made a mango plantation and somebody came along and took all my mangoes, right? That's expropriation. Um, uh, so the more country was slave raided 200 years ago, the more people say, they, they're at risk of expropriation of their uh, property. Uh, and then just a general indicator of rule of law, right? So a whole bunch of significant correlations. It does seem to be that countries that were exposed to the slave trade more <coughs> um, uh, performed worse. And then of course, I've been mentioning sort of ground truthing. Ground truthing involves always looking you know, at a particular case, it always says, well, let's look at the Africa's biggest success story, the highest, fastest growing country over 40 years since 19, uh, now uh, 60 years since 1960 was Botswana. And uh, there's no record at all in the colonial archives that there was really any slave raiding in Botswana. So it seems to have been one of the few countries that were basically completely untouched, partly because as we were kind of just talking, Botswana is a landlocked country in the interior, pretty low density. There was no profitability to slave raiding in Botswana because it was so far away from the coast uh, and the population density was pretty low that it just was never really exposed to the, to the slave trade. Let's continue on to the talk about Nunn and uh, Wanchikan's paper, right? So they're gonna say, all right, let's look more closely at one of the reasons why people might be poor in African countries because of the slave trade. Well, maybe it's because the slave trade engendered or propagated uh, a culture of distrust, a culture of mistrust. Uh, and trust is super important, right? You all trust that I'm going to grade your papers fairly. Hopefully you do, right? If you didn't, if you didn't trust that uh, you were going to be graded fairly, you might not put in much effort to learn in the class. Instead, you might say, how can I deliver $100 to Professor Kavane? Venmo, PayPal, what's the right way to get a high grade, right? Why should I trust that he's gonna grade my papers correctly? Um, you probably think the same thing about every single professor that you have. You trust that, oh, of course they're gonna grade me fairly. I trust that, right? How, how would you know that we do that? Um, you trust that we do. Um, so that kind of general trust that people are working uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a great example of the general trust and how it really reduces cost. I went down to La Quinta, as some of you know, for uh, Thanksgiving to do a lot of hiking. When we were driving back, we got rear-ended um, by a, a person, very minor uh, rear end, but we had a bike rack with uh, our bicycles on it and the bike rack and some of the bikes were pretty much destroyed. Um, the driver was a, seemed like a very nice person, very apologetic about it. Uh, so we exchanged our um, insurance information. Uh, about an hour later, uh, the driver's uh, father, the driver was a young woman, uh, called us and said, hey, uh, you know, I'll of course uh, pay any damages that were made and you can trust me. Uh, and uh, my wife was on the call and said, yeah, I trust you and you can trust us. Um, and we trust him that he's gonna pay us and he trusts us that we're not gonna take our 
uh, our car down to our local uh, mechanic and say, hey, Jerry, want to write up a bill for $7,000 for the, you know, the scratches on our, uh, uh, on our fender. So there's mutual trust on both sides. And that, of course, uh, means neither one of us has to hire a private investigator to find out, you know, are they telling the truth or not? Um, so trust is a really valuable social asset. So um, Nunn and Wanchikan's argument is that uh, maybe the slave trade really reduced trust. You've seen probably many of you 12 years a slave, uh, which is all about how people can be tricked into slavery, how people might start mistrusting other people. And that's the basic idea of, uh, uh, of their paper. So once I've explained the idea, don't have to do too much. Uh, Wanchikan has a short little video right here. Uh, and you, you'll be able to see the recording. You can write it down. I encourage you to take a look at his, uh, his explanation of the paper. It's a nice presentation of the, of the paper. Um, so uh, they, they provide some evidence that many people weren't uh, uh, sort of captured by raiders, but were rather tricked. And it's that trickery that you know, is really the basis for social mistrust. Um, so they uh, find a bunch of anecdotes and also some quantitative evidence suggesting that people were indeed tricked into uh, being enslaved. Uh, then they have measurements of today uh, about uh, how much trust people have from the Afrobarometer, a data set that we've seen in several other papers that we've looked at this quarter. So I won't go too much into um, this, uh, this data set, uh, basically, other than it's measuring trust. Uh, and let me just come to the regressions. Um, and so here's the map of the, uh, you know, the basic relationship that uh, uh, the places where there was a lot of slavery are, uh, uh, have uh, uh, lower levels of trust and places that had relatively less slavery have higher levels of trust. Um, now they're partly limited. You might say, well, what about Nigeria there? That, wasn't that the place with the most slave trade? But it's also the place where they didn't do the surveys. So that's why it's blank uh, here, not no, no red. So there, there are big measurement issues uh, associated with this paper. Uh, it's, and, and you might say, well, maybe the worst hit places are the places with the worst governments who are the least willing to let Afrobarometer come in and do the surveys. Um, and you'd be right. Uh, about about that, and that's definitely a, a problem for the uh, for for all this kind of research. But I'll be very brief because we're you know getting uh, getting towards the end of the hour. So the 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 basic uh, idea here is uh, that uh, measuring trust as the outcome and measuring the incidence of slave rating of the ethnic group that you belong to as the explanatory variable, the relationships are all quite statistically significant uh, and quite, uh, they're not huge in magnitude, but they're, they're reasonably sized in magnitude. So the more you were slave raided, the less you trust other people. The more your ethnic ancestors were slave raided, the less you trust other people. So that's the bottom line. And rather than me continuing on through these slides, I'm gonna let you see what kind of questions or comments you might have. I thought it was interesting that they went into so many narratives of different kinds of slave rating. I've never seen that in an economics paper before. I just thought mm -hmm. it was interesting. They like cited a whole book and then we're calling out stories. Yeah. That interesting. yeah, that's more typical in economic history, right? Where you uh, pay a little bit more attention to, and, and that's right what we've been calling ground truthing, right? So. Um, you ground through something by saying, hey, look, there's a whole book describing this. You know, for, It's not quantitative, but there's certainly many instances that, uh, uh, that, that are what we're talking about. So it isn't like we're making some, we're making up a correlation out of the data that hasn't been noticed by both members of the society and by historians and other people studying that society. So yeah, that's an important uh, point. Did they um, investigate any correlations with like the the ethnicity or the empire of the merchants themselves and the and the like you know long lasting effects of the economies from uh, yeah, that's a good the question. slaves? The 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 
the you know the problem with that is that the um, the the eth you know there were really the slave trade the Atlantic slave trade was uh, was 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 very much a British uh, enterprise. Uh, the, at, it started right as a Portuguese uh, um, trade, and then the the British and, and the French to some lesser degree uh, took over. There was there were Dutch slave traders. Um, but then over time, the, the British, of course, dominated the seas and the British Empire became the dominant empire. And so you, you're, you only have, you know, maybe three nationalities that you're working with, Portuguese, Dutch, and, and the British. So there's, there's not enough variation to do anything quantitative with that. And then, you know, the other thing is they were, they were being sold often in different places. So Dutch traders might be taking them to the Caribbean. British traders to uh, the New World, uh, to the to the Caribbean and and to the uh, uh, North America, and then the um, sorry, I keep uh, going off. Uh, Portuguese, of course, to to Brazil. So they they have different destinations. So I, I don't I don't know, but it's an interesting thing to think about. I don't know that there's that much research on trying to parse whether the nature of the those that slave trades, uh, and also they, you know, it was changing hands. So as as you probably know from your um, your uh, viewings of Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, which right is is how all of us have our history of of that period. Uh, I'm joking. It's not how we have our history of uh, that period. But uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, Puerto Rico, uh, you know, uh, changed hands several times. Um, and the, the, the famous fort in Puerto Rico, El, El Morro, uh, is, uh, you know, was besieged uh, by the uh, Dutch. Uh, the English came and tried to capture it. Many of the islands around Puerto Rico changed hands several times. Uh, and so there was a lot of, you know, overlap of these empires. There wasn't continuity um, in that in the, in that control of the of the sea other other questions comments I'll, I'll just mention this last thing since there's a little silence here uh, uh, a, a clever thing that they do that's uh, super super interesting is uh, to try and ask the question, uh, was this change in trust due to something that happened in the place where slaves were taken? Or was it something that happened to the people who were the descendants of the people who were enslaved? So imagine this scenario. Here's um, Nigeria. And Nigeria had a lot of slavery 200 years ago, right? Imagine that most of the Nigerians migrated over time some other place and a bunch of other people who had not experienced the slave trade, they migrated into Nigeria. If the legacy of the slave trade is a place-based thing, then those people would also be mistrusting. If the legacy of the slave trade was something that you had inside yourself, inside your head, then the legacy of the slave trade would shift, right? As the Nigerians moved away and other people moved in, there wouldn't be any legacy of the slave trade in uh, Nigeria. So they try and measure how much of it is kind of a place-based thing versus how much of it is an internal culture thing to the descendants of the people who were enslaved. Uh, by using the Afrobarometer's identification of everybody and their location. So they have identification of people who are from an ethnic group who no longer live in the area where that ethnic group lived 200 years ago. So they do have evidence of people from ethnic groups moving away. And using that evidence, they show that it seems like most of the legacy is something internal to people rather than about the place where people are. So if you move away, you carry that distrust with you. 
So that's an interesting thing to introspect about. Many of you have parents who are not native Californians and you can ask, let's say native Northern Californians, and you can ask, are my values and attitudes inherited from my parents or are they absorbed from the milieu of Silicon Valley that I've been in for the last four years? How much of my values are coming from someplace far away where my parents grew up and that their, their values are close to the values of the people who they lived with and how much of them are the result of me living here in this place uh, over time? That's the question that they're addressing, right? It's a really interesting question generally, how, how quickly, how slowly our values and attitudes change over time as we're exposed to um, new possibilities. I'm just buying time here for more questions. This is super unrelated to the paper, but that makes yeah. me feel that makes me think of like, I'm sure that and this is more so so sociology than like econ, but it would be cool to see like the degree to which um, children's values are like, you know, less a product of their parents or their location today compared to the past. Because now we have the internet and now you can like formulate your political affiliation, your level of, you know, trust or distrust of authority, all those things can be determined by a million people who you've never met, depending on what kind of info you seek out. So I think it'd be cool to see, like, I would, I would imagine that, you know, the, the town you grew up in or the region of the country or which nation at all you grew up in is becoming less and less important for people's like ideologies across a bunch of different right. issues. Right. Yes. Yeah. So the, the local you would expect, right. Uh, that the local is becoming less and less a determinant, an explanatory variable in uh, in in individual uh, formulations, right? So you might think that. On the other hand, you might think that because of your exposure to all this cosmopolitan ideas, you're even more likely to try and stick with your local. What do you call them? Uh, your besties. Norm. Your besties. <laughs> Is that the wrong word? Nobody laughed. <laughs> so your your local your you you become tighter, right? You become more conformist because now the world is a big ocean, and you want to swim with your. Uh, I'm mixing up many metaphors here. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's a great it's a great question. Um, one of the areas where that's been explored, and Nan and Wachikan in their paper. Uh, uh, cite the work that was done on this, which is that migrants coming to the United States, uh, especially in particular looking at women, uh, women coming into the United States tend to have levels of fertility, that is how many children they have, that are correlated with the fertility from the countries that their parents came from. And that diminishes over the generations, but the pattern is still there. So even a third generation, I'm making up a nationality, a third generation Hungarian might be more likely to have different fertility than a third generation Spaniard. Um, and, and if Spain and Hungary did indeed differ in their, in their uh, patterns of uh, uh, female fertility of how many children a, a woman has. Um, so that's been a, you know, that's the kind of intergenerational transmission of basically what's a preference, right? How many children to have. Um, they're all living in the United States. So presumably they face basically the same economic environment. So it isn't that they differ by their incentives. Instead, they differ by their preferences. I have one more question about the paper. Yeah. Um, it's not like slavery is, is, not still going on in some parts of Africa like it might be different in the slave trade isn't as like formal or not as like based you know going to U.S. but like for example I had to watch this documentary in my business ethics class about like Burkina Faso and people being basically sold by like friends and relatives to go work on like cocoa plantations in Ghana or you know things like that and I think it's interesting it might just be because it's really hard to measure but you could have a lot lower trust in areas where slavery still goes on and that could, you know, be highly correlated with where slavery, slavery used to go on. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's interesting that I didn't see any controls for that. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's definitely, uh, I, I'd say, you know, the, the nature of slavery itself changes over time, right? And so uh, the kind of slavery that were, uh, that the slave trade was, uh, was about, was about uh, uh, adults uh, who, who were forced to work through extreme threats of physical violence, right? If you, and we, you know, you, you just have to watch a little bit of movies and read a little bit of history to know that that's the level of violence that happened, right? People's arms being chopped off, uh, people being branded, uh, uh, all kinds of extreme physical violence uh, was the, the, the order of the day, uh, both in the south of the United States, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, and in Brazil. Uh, and then the, so, so, so that's, that's a very different kind of slavery um, than the slavery of uh, cocoa plantations today, where, uh, you know, it's, a, it's more of a child bondage thing, uh, a, like a debt peonage, like an apprenticeship, like you have to work because your parents got money. Um, uh, they sold you, right? Um, and, and so you have to work. Uh, but there's really no, to my knowledge, you know, very limited enforcement of that other than the psychological manipulation of the child, right? And as a child, you're very vulnerable. Your parents sold you. Therefore, you have no place to go. So you have to stay here. But of course, once the child becomes, you know, 16, 17, the child's like, I don't have to stay here. Um, and, 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 and then they leave. Um, and, and there isn't, they're not shackled, I guess, would be the, the way I would frame it, the way, at least there's very little evidence that that kind of slavery is happening uh, in, uh, especially in these cocoa areas. Um, so it's different, but it's a point well taken that they're very hard to measure. Um, uh, I, I don't know that there's really any credible measures of, of, of this kind of, you know, bondage, child bondage that, that's going on. Well, you've uh, run, run out the clock. You've escaped the instrumental variables explanation. This is a great example, though, of an instrumental variables estimator. So if, you're, if you took Econ 173 and want to see a good example of, of it, then this paper is your, your friend. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, then just briefly go and get a glass of water. Um, I will uh, then come back for people who want to uh, uh, discuss papers. Or, so I'll be on for until 4.30. Um, so if you want to also take a break and then come back, uh, probably, you know, just uh, take one person at a time for maybe 10 minute period. So I'll just establish a real quick order um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, assign people slots and you can come back online if you want to talk to me. Otherwise, I'll be uh, on office hours, I think, tomorrow again. I'll, I'll make some office hours for the um, for maybe uh, Saturday or Sunday and, and then for, for next week, uh, too. So there'll be plenty of opportunities. So don't feel like this is your only chance, um, which is not. So uh, I hope you've all learned the Jerusalem dance. And uh, we'll, when we get back together in person, we'll have a big uh, thing on the lawn uh, of uh, Santa Clara. It's looking like we might, right? Spring, You're just in time for you to graduate. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm keeping fingers crossed, Makana. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, professor? Yes. I had a quick question. I would